Um, I want to call the meeting to order and announcement of audio video recording of this meeting. And this meeting is exactly one hour long. We've got ordinance coming in right at six o'clock. I would like to do the counselor. Do you have your minutes? No, I do not have them. I, I move to accept the minutes. I've read them. Okay. Yeah. The amendments for November 19th and January 14th, they've been approved by Bill. Second. Second by Eugene. Okay, thank you. Um, Peg, thank you again for being here. And Peg Keller is um, the Housing and Community Development Planner for the City of Northampton. And she is going to be talking about the status of CDBG funding awards, city action <coughs> plan priorities, and scheduling public services interviews. It's all yours. Thank you all for having me. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> let's um, let's start with the scheduling stuff first. Just want to confirm. Yeah. March 11th, 12th, 13th. And at what I've time? got the what time are those? Uh, we weren't sure what your schedule was these days, Councillor Tacey, but um, as far as your availability in the evening. But um, I'm very flexible. The book, the room is booked from 5.30 to 8.30. I didn't know if we could start that early. And then I've got the fire department for the first two nights, but they couldn't give me the third. So for the third night, we're in the hearing room. So fire department community room for yep. Monday and Tuesday and then up here for Wednesday. And as you know, we're going to need every moment and hopefully be able to do the deliberation at the end of the last night. Again, if we're not too fried. But, okay, um, so can I get this straight now? Sure. The 11th, 12th, and 13th from 5.30 to when? Well... <laughs> dot dot dot. Yeah. Eight thirty. Nine. Hopefully no later. Yeah, that's and those two dates, eleven and twelve, are at the fire station. Right. And then on the thirteenth it's in the hearing room, five thirty to eight thirty. Okay. Thank you, Paul. So the committee composition I had emailed um, Reverend Ives. He is not available. He said he's uh, pinch hitting for um, Reverend Az Azazian. Yep. Oh, yeah, Azazian. she's, oh, yes. She for three months, she's on sabbatical. So he's up there, and he's busy with that. So I, yeah. I checked in with um, Peter Kakos because he's also retired and has also done this before. But he's, mm -hmm. he's starting. He's going to start in Hatfield. In Hatfield. Yeah. Yeah. What's he going to do there? He's, He's their guy. Church. Yeah. Hatfield Church. Really? I forgot about that. So he may not be available. But my third thought is the new guy at First Church is because I think we've talked about the fact that prior to his coming to First Churches, he ran an emergency shelter for eight years in Poughkeepsie. And he wants to come to my next step meetings, oh. which is my housing and homeless service providers. And he's been involved in our discussion with the Cutchins program folks about um, the neighborhood outreach that came about after the incident, you know, with one of their students. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and part of that discussion was Reverend Belkey, who's in charge of College Church kind of trying to figure out his, you know, spiritual mission responsibility versus being able to handle a crowd of 60 people who are having mm -hmm. breakfast there in the mornings. So I put Reverend Weir from First Church is in touch with Reverend Belkey at College Church. And I think they're going to be having more conversations yeah. because Reverend Weir, you know, kind of really gets the needs of the population, and, and he's been very involved in the discussions of trying to get the drop-in center moved from 43 Center, possibly to the basement of First Churches, if we can figure out how to work that out. But um, So I'm thinking, if Reverend Kekos can't do it, then maybe Reverend Weir would be logical, and I don't know how that 
Like Easter is what, like April or something? So no, it's early this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know what his. I think it's in March, isn't it? Time of year. I don't know. We lost the poll yeah, anyway. Yeah, it is. And they said that's one of the reasons why. Yes. Easter is so time-consuming for yep. folks in that line of Easter work. Easter is on March 31st. Okay. So you know this is huge for anyone to give us three whole nights yep. consecutive. But I'll keep nosing around. Um, Carol Reinhardt, Human Rights Commission, said she is. She was filling in for Sarah Weinberger, who did it initially and really yes. enjoyed it. So Carol's going to give a, a nod to Sarah to see if Sarah wants to come back. And she said, how about if we do this? The Human Rights Commission will commit to someone. Okay. And they will give us a member. Okay. I mean, ideally, someone is going to be able to attend all three okay. meetings. Right. Right. They know that. Yeah, okay. And I think Carol may, but she just really wanted to let Sarah kind of get back into it if she wanted to. And... Uh, you, you may know more than I, but I think they're getting some new members, and I think they're, well, we, they may have some folks that... Well, they lost them. They lost they did, several. Okay. B.J. Prashad, mm -hmm. Emily Hodges, I think Emily's moved to D.C. Okay. B.J. is in India, I think, right now, or something. And we interviewed some of them. I, I knew, uh, didn't Rick Hart get on, and then Wanda Willam, I heard, two friends of the homeless folks. Rick Hart did, yeah. Okay. And Wanda Rolone. And Wanda, yeah, I think we proved, yeah. So well, the, Wanda, the, you know, that would be a conflict because she's mm -hmm. a servicement person. Right. Yeah. The, they don't stay long. Actually, yeah. I like the idea of, of the new pastor at First Church of the I mean, it, and it would be a, a good introduction for him for the the scope of the services. Yeah, I thought about that, and I thought, you know, new blood would be great. I kind of wanted to recognize the institutional mm -hmm. history of either the two Peters, but um, we got his name. It's Todd Weir, W E I R, Reverend. And he's, you know, he's probably my age, and he's building up at Hospital Hill. You know, they're very much committed to the community. So I will keep you posted. Okay. So if the three of you and then someone from the clergy and somebody from human rights, um, I'm happy to go beyond that if you feel like you need to. I know, it'd be so nice if we can get on to it. Well, I think, I, I, I mean, I think it's a decent size for um, what we have to do. And when you start piling on more people, Yeah. I like it. I feel like five. We have five. Yeah. Okay. So I will let you know. Okay. Um, and as far as what we think we might be looking at, this chart is something that came pulled together so you could see the, uh, yeah. the variations in the dollar amounts over yeah. the years. Um, the, now, we have really... Remember we, I was telling you that because I emailed her about your concerns with the CDBGs up in Amherst. And she replied back to me, so maybe you can talk about that, of what went on in Amherst. Yeah, uh, they, I think um, Council Labarge was noticing the articles in the paper about that they didn't get funds. No, he noticed that. Yeah, I told you he had concerns oh, that we might be getting yeah. hurt. Well, they're in a different category. and. Um, they've ebbed and flowed, as has East Hampton over the years, because they go directly to the state for the federal funds. And we still don't really know why. We get it directly from the feds, um, probably because we're the county seat, although usually it's for populations 50,000 and over. It was extremely confusing to read the two articles of the paper and then to talk to the auditors. Mm -hmm. um, and they really had no explanation as to why they went to the state for this money. Um, they always right. have, yeah, because they're below the population threshold, and it's also a formula-based thing on yeah. poverty levels and per capita income. And, and Amherst is an anomaly, given that part of their population census is the students, and they have such a significant. I mean, I know they benefit from lottery funds because the the reflection of the students' average into the income levels make Amherst seem to be much poorer on the snapshot than they actually are. But, uh, 
a lot of people have feelings about that. <laughs> what do you think? Well, what, I, I haven't heard anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I found it funny as the administration in, the, in, in Amherst East Hampton really did not know too much about CDBG funds. So it's not something that I, 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 I couldn't understand. Well, John just Sandy is, but, would. But not, what's that? John Sandy. John, John would, yeah. yeah. I didn't talk to John. But yeah. if we're going to be. My question, I, I, you know, I questioned this last time, the 20% for administration out of this fund here. Is there any other way to handle some of those administrative costs with other funds rather than, I mean, as it keeps, you, you take the administration out, first you take the, the senior center out, you're down to 217000 and then you take the administration out, you're down to 112000 I mean, it keeps, I'm just kind of curious, right. is there some other way to fund some of the administration well the evolution of the administration has been an interesting path also I think when I started Wayne Wayne's position was taking a piece um, Kareen in mm -hmm. the mayor's office had a piece James had a piece the GIS guy in the planning department there was a full-time CDBG coordinator I had a piece and Cam had a piece and they weaned Wayne away. I think James is completely off of it. Yeah. When Terry Anderson left, you know, she she came out of the mayor's office to take the economic yeah. development coordinator yeah. position off city budget onto CDBG. When the mayor hired the new Terry, Terry too, he's completely back on the city budget. So the only CDBG admin is Cam and I, and. You know, we haven't gotten raises in three years, so it's really okay for two people. Yeah. And since I have gotten out from under the McKinney grant as of December 1, after 16 years, that went to Hilltown CDC, yep. we are, are just doing the CDBG stuff and then, you know, other Northampton projects. So there is actually excess of about maybe close to 9,000 that the mayor may want to do something with, but you can only, you can, you, there's a cap for how much you can spend on admin, but there's no, there's no minimum. That's what I'm getting so, at. So yeah, know. it can, it can come down, but I don't, and you guys know the city budget more than I, but I'm, and actually at the end of last year when Terry Anderson left and there was some extra in admin, mm -hmm. Susan Wright took it to cover our health benefits. Yep. from the CDBG budget, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was just interested in how creative can we get with. Well, the senior center thing, believe it or not. Goes away in another year. We have this year 311,621. Yes. And next year is 145,613. And then it's off CDBG. It was supposed to be like a five-year gig, and it turned out to be like eight or something. Yep. And then I don't know what happens. The city goes on, probably. Where do you see that for next year? Uh, right well, here in my notes. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So then, you know, we may have some wiggle room. And But this this 10% cut, you know, over the last two years, it's been 30% cumulatively. I can't remember whether it was 16, 14, or the other way around. But... And the only thing that this 10% is based on is me emailing the HUD rep and saying, what do you hear? And he said that everyone is instructed to do their annual planning based on a 10% cut, and hopefully it won't be that much. Yeah. So I was talking to Cam about it today, and I'm thinking, you know, they're going to either have to commit to this program at the federal level or not, because mm -hmm. if they just keep knocking it knocking down, it down. It's, useless. it's going to, it is, it's going to get pointless. So at, at some point they just have to decide, yeah, are they going to do it or not? Made right. And not, not just cut the legs out from under it. So, but considering the lack of, of anything being solidified as far as, you know, federal budgets and any of this stuff, I have no idea. And I don't know how long it's going to be. Before we know, so we're in the same boat. But at least he's not saying mm -hmm. yeah. 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. Maybe now, we should listen to the State of the Union tomorrow and see if he yeah. addresses it. Now, yep. so I think you and I were colleagues together when the CDBGs were gone. We didn't have it for a while. 
Do you remember that? Who was running that then? Was it Abbott then? Yeah. Or Mike Owen? Yeah. I think so, because something happened there. Well, I, I know what you're talking about. Mike Owen, first off, the city wanted the CDBG to pay 100% of the senior center. Oh. And there would have been nothing that, that didn't happen. Okay. That did not happen, but the city actually charged Mike Owens with figure out to pay 100% of the senior center debt service with block grant money, and it was absurd. Um, it just Something didn't. happened because yeah. nothing was yeah. going it, it, on. Yeah, it did not happen, and um, so they, that that was tabled. Was, that was thrown out. It was just a bad idea, mm -hmm. um, and here we are with, with half of it. But I remember that. Uh, Look at the, if we if next year with the 10%. Was in the yep. That will give us. Last year was five hundred and eighty-eight thousand four hundred three. Yep. The ten percent knocks us to five twenty-nine. There was a really early year, like nineteen eighty-nine. Yep. Something. It was. It was that amount. Huh. So, it really kind of has been all over the place. But last year we had eighty-eight thousand two sixty to work with for public services. So if we're looking at ten percent reduction this year, that gives us seventy-nine. In last, in last year, we had 88000 and we had $287,000 worth of requests. Exactly. Or something. I, this is off the top of my head. I don't have the... I, don't I was going to say, where are you getting these figures? No, it's just, I'm, these are my notes. So in FY02, we had $918,000. That was the highest point. Uh, yeah. Since like 85. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. And, and, and then, so the disparity between that amount and the amount from last year is $360,000. A three hundred sixty thousand dollar cut, or, or actually more significantly, it's, it's mm. cut by over a third from that point. Yeah. And I mean, I would say, just in the main, that given <laughs> given the public, you know, we're, they're queuing up for an election last year. There was there was the re Republicans were jockeying for a lot of position and looking for places to cut. And then they came up with the brilliant sequestration idea and everything else. But the drama was much more intense then, and not much in the mood for cooperation, particularly for federal programming. Um, and that might be reflected in this, this kind of ridiculous <coughs> number. And maybe, hopefully this year, that, that um, with any luck, and I'm just being optimistic, that it gets picked up a little bit. I mean, it's, although it is coincidental with the fact that there could be Across the board cuts of eight percent, and that would certainly include, I would imagine, CDBG grants. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it would. I mean, it's cutting defense, cutting all social service programming without without an eye towards impact. And then, Democrat, you had Democrats. They were all jockeying for a position in 2010 too. We actually got seventy thousand dollars more in CDBG than we did in '09, and then we took a significant hit, which was sixteen percent. And then 14 percent, and now maybe 10 percent. Well, you know the whole sequestration thing, you know, kicking the can down the road. You know, you can only kick the can so far, and then it will fall off the cliff. So this whole thing is going to come up right around the time we're probably trying to make our decisions exactly. for the yeah. month. Hmm. So who knows? But the process has begun. The other sheet that you have is laying out the. We sent the RFP out to everybody. And we're going to start the public hearings, the first of which is Wednesday night. Because part of, part of your piece, your, your piece is part of this bigger picture. Right. When, when we had more money, right. you know, we'd give to DPW or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's part of this annual action plan that's required by HUD. And the, the process from year to year was you do your action plan saying what you're going to do from July 1 mm -hmm. through June 30th of the next year. And then you come in in the fall and you report on the prior year's activities. And this is the last year it is going to be on paper. So oh, be just so you can have these for your posterity. It's, it's, on, it's on a black binder. binder. It's on the this city. Is Website under um, housing, okay. CDBG, yeah, it's, 
You put in a black binder for a this is wonderful. No, it's just what we had in the. Well, this is what we do every year, twice a year, but I don't really ever show it to anybody except for HUD. Um, but this is part of our trying to get more information out about, you know, what's going on in the community. And, mm -hmm. and then HUD looks at it and makes sure that you did what you say you were going to do. And, you know, if you're looking like you're not, you know, then you get to the top of the monitoring list, and then lo and behold, they show up. But um, so this, the public hearing process is really trying to get a sense from the community of what the needs are. <coughs> usually it's um, housing and homeless service providers, and then usually the folks that get CDBG money because they're afraid not to show up, <laughs> right. even, even though it's not mandatory. But um, it's usually just a kind of a good preliminary discussion about what people are seeing. And I spend a lot of time just asking people what's going on out there. Because I do, um, you know, I don't want to be in the ivory tower without knowing what people are really facing. So mm -hmm. I usually give a preliminary rundown on what we're looking at and some of the highlights of last year. And then I just go around the table and let people start talking about trends that they're seeing and issues and things that are appearing before them that are just really beyond their ability to deal with and what they're seeing and because my whole role is just to make sure that I understand what's going on out there and what the city can or cannot do to help them either find resources or talk to people and just make sure that you know, everybody's doing everything they can. Then, and I'm sure you assumed or anticipated or, or had some thoughts in your mind about what we're going to do moving forward when we no longer lose the $300,000 out of this for the senior center. What do you have? Do you have anything on your radar? Well, my thing that I keep coming back to is the housing rehab program. Yeah. Because, you know, as the dollars got smaller and the Council on Aging, yeah. Council on Aging and Valley CDC both said it's such a time-consuming endeavor and without a critical mass and a lot of staff capability to do units, you know, more than two or three in the course of a year. Um, the Council on Aging ended up kind of losing the business manager, and then Patty ended up doing it, mm -hmm. and so she bailed this past year, and Valley CDC bailed two years ago, maybe it was longer ago now. And, you know, everything that you see data collection-wise for the city of Northampton, over our, half of our housing inventory is built before, like, 1970. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of folks that really just aren't able to carve off any amount of money to take care of their property. So I think it's somewhat unconscionable that the city of Northampton, the size that it is with the housing stock, age that it does, doesn't have some way to help people do some home improvement. So that's always been my, on the top of my list. And then, uh -huh. Didn't you know, they we get away with that? The home repair at the Council on Aging? Yes. Yeah. They that was had, Bill the Bombard. Yes. They had something small. Jim Ross. Yep. Mm -hmm. But it got down to, um, Patty wasn't really using the money that she was getting every year. She wasn't really getting it out the door. So it kept kind of, backing up so she had big amounts and then they she wasn't getting new allocations until she drew down what she had and then it got to the point where we were just giving them dollars for admin for staffing because there was still loans and grants dollars but I think her operation has gotten significantly sophisticated and then when Karen left there just wasn't anybody and she said you know what and they did it for a long time and there are other people that do it. Pioneer Valley Regional Planning has a program. Hilltown CDC might be interested in expanding. They had a program. So I think I could find somebody, but I just wanted to get a, a decent dollar. Right. Bank. You don't want to, you don't want to yeah. offer a wheezy amount. Right. Of it. Yeah. right. <laughs> it was a great program. I did, I did a lot of repair. I did a lot of stuff that were health and safety issues in, in homes throughout the city. Be, it has to be code related. Yeah, I can't even count them all. And um, they were people that really needed it. Well, you were one of the primary contractors. Yeah. And it's hard to find folks who want to do the smaller jobs and have to hassle with the paperwork. And it, was, it, was, it was very tough. And a lot of homeowners just need a lot of um, 
attention. Yeah. So mm -hmm. huge value, time consuming project. Yeah. But that still would probably be on the It was good work, though, in the committee. It was good, it was good work. And when, and when it comes down to it for, for the public's interest, that's not money that we have discretion over the council. The reason I say that is if, if Councilor Tacey is a contractor for these these uh, allotments, yeah. it's not like he's voting on the money. He has no, there's no conflict there. It's what we're what we're deciding is what's left over that's given out to social service program. Right. Knowing that this is being recorded, and I wouldn't want mm -hmm. it to just so yeah. everyone understands. No, right. Good, that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The yeah. LACDs, or whoever would be doing it, would have to do their own selection right. process they would do their for own the contract. contract. And, and they also, and they solicited bids. And right. You went right. to bid openings, and um, right. it was it was very above board, and it was just um, it was a good program. It was a program that was really needed. And um, still and talk I, about it. I think wish they had it. Yeah, and I, I, that's why I, that was one of the reasons I had asked the question about what do you have. What are you anticipating when this money becomes available? <laughs> what is yeah. that quote unquote, you know? Right. Well, I, I almost hesitate to Decided. even circulate the application and the RFP to other department heads because if we, that one little tiny one line mm -hmm. chart, if, if it's the 10%, we'll have like $32,000 yeah. of stuff to give out beyond public services. but. Um, you know, and we helped DBW with Con Street the year before, but they wanted something for North Street this past year, and we just had nothing. Right. And usually there's some component of infrastructure, and so I would definitely um, be happy to put the word out and try to see what some of the other city needs are. I do know that Forbes is always... <laughs> so I think they came in... They came in for design a few years ago for the elevator and they, the they accessibility need, stuff. No, they have no handicap accessibility. Right. And they've just they, gone to, I think, the CPC for window replacement. So they still have some big ticket items. And since CDBG paid for the design mm -hmm. of the elevator, it would be great if we could actually throw in some real dollars. I think it's about, I think they said it's a half a million dollar project and they got like 200 so far committed so they they're now in a specific fundraising mode because HUD doesn't like it when you give somebody dollars for design and then nothing happens mm -hmm. so them? so we're happy that they're in a fundraising mode specific for the accessibility for the elevator and the yeah mm -hmm. well that's good. right that's a little longer than I personally would like them they're to like 268,000 bucks short of their goal right now I think was the number. Yeah, and this was, their original configuration was a redone entrance on the children's side, and then that was way mm -hmm. out of whack of what they thought it was going to be, and I think they've tabled that, and now they're just doing the, it was the big lift. Blade. I guess it's not the lift, it's the elevator, elevator. Yeah. in the front. Right. Right. And yeah. I know the elevator's still not operable, because she mm -hmm. just got stuck with it with her mother a couple weeks ago. Yeah. That lift has been non-functional since its installation. I know. Which um, I... I think it might have been CDBG a long time ago, too. Because yeah. I know Pat Shaughnessy, because we brought it up on the Committee on Disabilities, yeah. Yeah. and she called Forbes, and they were going back and forth with the company. They were waiting for a part. Well, the part came in. <laughs> they got stuck in it. They had well, to get it inspected. <coughs> they got it inspected. And... Well, my brother well, had I ALS. We actually it. ordered one of those lifts for his house to get him up to the porch. Who? My brother. Yeah. And he died before the lift came in. I mean, it was a year. That's I couldn't just, get uh, it. Those are what you're describing as the chairlifts, right? It's a chairlift, yeah. which is pretty it's much what they have now. Which is what they, which Forbes. is what they have. That right. it's basically a big paperweight. Yeah. And uh, the it's in, a fact. In the it's and the right. fact is is that the public library is not available to a large portion yeah, of the public, right. and um, it is not conforming to their mission. Right. And and. I, I hope that, I mean, my hope was that they would always, I understand there are a lot of extenuating circumstances, but my hope is that, that, that they uh, would prioritize this and move it along. And now, hopefully with the added incentive of HUD saying you want the money to stay secure towards this project, then you have to start working on the project. I mean, it's, I understand there are all sorts of other distractions, but I think this is kind of elemental to their mission. 
it's, it's so. Mm -hmm. So but, that would probably be on the top of the list also. But if they need, I think she said she was going to come in. She, she asked me, if I come in for like 200 grand, am I going to be denied? And I said, well, anybody should come in with right. anything right. and, and so with what with they me. need so we know what the universe is. And you won't but get if, it if you don't ask. Right, but <laughs> I, you know, if our universe is 32 grand, then, right. you know, that's 32 grand. But yeah. But I don't want to be so caught at a point, and I know, I know, and I know you're on top. But I don't want to be caught at a point where all of a sudden we have a couple hundred thousand dollars, and what are we going to do with it? Which is going to happen when this senior center, thankfully, yeah, thankfully, that's which we've tough, been dying to have happen. That's a good problem. And I, to have. And I don't think <laughs> yeah, I don't, Ned really hasn't come forward because he just doesn't. You know, he knows we don't really have anything. Yeah, but I'm sure. You know, street sidewalk infrastructure stuff in eligible neighborhoods, which I'm sure that. He has projects that would mm -hmm. fit that bill. And we then just, the other thing we got a call from um, somebody at Smith Vogue talking about something accessibility related. So oh. I don't know if there's going to be something coming in from them. From but, school board? But those are the only outside things that we have had come in that we weren't anticipating. Forbes, Smith Vogue, oh, and then AIDS Care of Hampshire County came in. Um, Betsy Shelley Jensen, the program at Cooley Dick, and she said, what's the likelihood? Because she would just be in the public services pot. Mm -hmm. And I told her, you know, about the $2,100 or whatever that we were able to carve out last year for community legal aid. I said, but, you, you know, come in. You're welcome to come in. Because it, it would be an educational value if, if that alone, if we couldn't do anything for you. But the problem is most of their folks are housed outside of Fort right. Hampton. So she said, I would have to get a little tiny bit from Northampton for the little few folks that are here, a little tiny bit from Amherst. So she was thinking about going to the United Way and getting something more regional or whatever. But, mm -hmm. but that's a problem. It's also interesting with um, the Community Preservation Committee. Any of these groups that serve people outside of the city of Northampton, we can't have CPC dollars going out of town. So yeah, it's got to be in definitely. Well, due to the fact that a lot of those other groups <coughs> now are part of the CBA. So right. they have their own CBA right. funds. And that's yeah. the we actually had a little wrinkle in that where we were leasing plots of garden space to people from out of town. Mm. So that was... Where you were? Yeah, East Hampton and their rent spaces. Uh, yeah, and then we, we won't get into it right now. Well, let me just mention something else now that I'm thinking of it. Um, they have changed the language for what's eligible through the Community Preservation Committee. And direct assistance to individuals is now eligible. So one of the biggest things that I see in my next step group with the Housing and Homeless Service Providers is people don't have first and last and security. They may have secured some income that's going to be stable enough that they can pay rent every month, but to come up with a big wad, you know, to, to rent an apartment. And Friends of the Homeless gives a little bit of money out of what Yvonne raises, and they give to ServiceNet. But we thought, okay, this is eligible now, mm -hmm. so let's try to go to the CPC and get a piece. And then this is the discussion that we started to have, because Northampton is virtually unaffordable then a lot of the folks that ServiceNet serves that are coming out of the shelter system get housed in other communities. So we can't have those dollars leave the community. I, as a CPC person, I wouldn't vote for that, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't even propose it. No. So then we started to back into it thinking, okay, what if Northampton landlords, that's who you write the right. check to, right. so you can guarantee right. that the unit is here. And then as we were working through it, ServiceNet, Seth Dunn and Wanda had this brilliant idea that they create a revolving loan fund by asking people to pay it back once they're stable. Okay. So they have made an application to the CPC in this round, and Forbes is in there. There's a project from Pomerantz for City Hall facade. Yep. Yes. Yep. There's a couple other, I think, there's a recreation project and maybe a conservation project, but this is the only housing-related thing. And this is going to be an interesting discussion at the CPC because they really like bricks-and-mortar tangible projects that 
you can really know what you're getting. But this is an eligible activity now. So I'm glad to hear I got that. about we got about maybe ten support letters and we put this application together, ten grand pilot project. Mm -hmm. We may we might not even be able to find enough units in Northampton to use all that money, but Florence Inn, Bridge Street SRO, some of the other units that ServiceNet has that they can make direct referrals mm -hmm. to, individuals and families mm -hmm. to maybe try to get some of the families moving along too. So we're going to go to the CPC at whatever their schedule is, you know, end of February, March, and try to make this pitch. And I think there's, I hear that there are CPC folks that don't, you know, that it's going to be a tough sell. They don't want to fund staff positions, which is kind of, you know, like an interesting dilemma too. Don't want to give money to like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund because they kind of just want to get a project that they can wrap their arms around and know exactly what you're getting. But this direct assistance to individuals is eligible now, so we're gonna we're gonna go down that road and see where it gets us. But Peg, I wanted to ask you now with this direct assistance, which we didn't have before, now we do. Okay, how much does it actually cost for rent that it was such a big problem with, with the first and the last? It what? could be like fifteen hundred dollars if you've got five hundred bucks. Unit. People and I first class and security, which yeah. is a real variable. And hey, apartments are a grand. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be that can be a one bedroom also, a thousand dollars. It's so. a it's a big stumbling block for people to come up with that much at one time. That's way without much. family and friends. And right. And a lot of these apartments too are fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred two bedroom apartments yep. in Northampton. So you come up with five thousand dollars just to move into a place. What about in Florence? What's the rental up there? They're they're Depends getting up on there. Where you're looking. They're they're following suit. Are they really? Yeah. So it's it's very it's tough. Just a few more things in this report. You'll see that. Production is something that we're trying to pay attention to. You know, Valley CDC's King Street SRO was kind of the last thing in the queue. And um, Soldier On is moving ahead with their big development up there, but that mm -hmm. will be exclusively vets. It will be men and women, and they're going to do some, some great work to flesh out their their kind of care continuum that they're creating on their own, everything from emergency shelter all the way to home ownership, they're doing the whole thing. So the big the big project up at as you look at the VA, it'll be on the right. You know, it's gonna be backing up against that fair right property. Yep. And that's really the only thing, um, except for the two housing authority parcels that we haven't been able to get popped. And the um, the one for 10 clients used to be Department of Mental Retardation that's now De Department of Developmental Services. I was trying to find out from height if the funding for that is in this bond bill that they're dealing with the state. There's a housing bond bill. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't think so because um, with everything being so tight, the philosophy is that two million dollars would go a lot farther for renovating existing units as opposed to building a new project for ten people. So I don't know if that's ever going to see the light of day. And what about the consolidation of uh, the governor's proposal to consolidate housing authority? Yeah. See, there's an argument made on that well, renovation work too, whether or not it's cheaper well, to renovate or build new. The client population for this Burt's Pit project, you know, that they got four parcels from the state hospital disposition. Mm -hmm. They did the Paradise Pond Apartments, and then they did the Mary McCollion, and then it was the Laurel Street one, which is kind of <coughs> catty corner to the back of the Grove Street Inn. They want to do home ownership there, and then that requires a legislative revision by um, Representative Cocott, and he said, you know, he's willing to do that if he. Mm -hmm. I guess they were trying to bundle a few other things that they needed to change. So they were they're strategizing around that. And then that was um, 
it's actually been dormant for so long that I took MJ Adams over with me to talk to Height and said, you know, Habitat can do this. Even though there's no home ownership money coming from the state, if you partner with someone, we could maybe make this thing roll, but they still need the legislative change to make it home ownership because everything said it was supposed to be for rental. And I think it's a great thing for the Housing Authority to be able to offer to Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights folks. You actually have a home ownership opportunity that you can work towards. And she's not. And so that was kind of the plan. Anymore. She left. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we still need Representative Colcott to make this change. And then the Bird's Pit project was the fourth. And then the Housing Authority will have met its development responsibilities for those parcels. But um, what about the assistant living that might occur at the state hospital? Is that still in the process? Yeah, yes. they're going to start oh, yeah, that's, that's soon. Really they're soon. rolling. And I think 43 out of their 83 units are going to be affordable. Oh, yep. that's super. And I don't know how that is, but somehow they're getting the tax credits. They're getting all the funding sources in that they need. They're coming to, they came to the CPC. Did you guys vote on that? Already? Yeah, we did. Okay. Oh, we approved we it. So, the TIF. what we the TIF bonus, yeah. I mean, somebody can go up there and even if they can pay their own way for a little while and then they can't anymore, they can switch to the assisted units and they don't even have to move out of the unit. I actually dug into that after the meeting. And if all 43 units are consumed and somebody that has assets or assets do run out, yeah. it's actually uh, through the state and the federal government, they get a credit which will cover the cost of the unit. And so if you run out of assets, you can stay in that same unit. And now they have 44 affordable units. So nobody gets kicked out. I so like that. Nobody gets thrown out. It sounds too good to be true. Yeah. But and then if you're, um, and then it's not like, it's not like people stay there forever. No. Well, that's they the either move on to yeah. more, yeah, more, more medically oriented um, facility, or for whatever reason they're not there anymore. But yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Marblehead started out with fifty percent affordability. They're up to sixty-two percent now. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. So they keep people stay, and they keep in the affordability part grows, which is the only reason which I agreed to vote on the tax, the uh, TIF, is because the the affordability. Element in there. Well, Marblehead's well, an extremely affluent community. And yes. And so their their concept of affordability compared to oh, or saying well, Newton Wellesley is affordable at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a unit. So. Yeah. <laughs> but if we get the sixty units at the VA and the forty three as a baseline here, that'll be like a hundred right. some odd units well, that we get to add to, to keep to us our stock. on that subsidized housing inventory. But the housing partnership. Um, which just had elections this past January, and Lynn Wallace, who lives locally, she's also the co-chair of the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness, was my vice chair on the housing partnership, and Gordon Shaw was the chair. Mm -hmm. Gordon stepped down, Lynn stepped up, and then we have a woman who moved into Michael's house, mm -hmm. Audrey Easter, who is the new vice chair, who came up from the Maryland area a few years ago, and she's um, like a geriatric psychologist, and knows a whole lot about senior housing and design issues. She's the vice chair. And they'll be coming before you in May. Yep. Marianne's got them booked for May. So we'll be talking to them. But one of the things that they want to do for this annual action plan for the housing partnership is to have a developers forum with private developers and nonprofit developers oh. and also take the inventory of anything that we think is possibly able to be used in Northampton, either municipally owned or not, vacant land, vacant buildings, empty space, and we're, we're calling it massmatch.com. But we're going to put the developers in, mm. developers in a room. Mash, mash. That's good. <laughs> put them all together. Developers in a room with a list maybe of actual projects and sponsored by the housing partnership, you know, HAP. Habitat, Soldier On, Valley, Community Builders. Her. I forget who else was on the list. Um, yeah, it's like, and then there's a new women's group, Women's Institute for Housing and Economic Development. There's a woman that works for them that lives in town. 
and you know Goggins and Wright Builders and the people that are doing the mm -hmm. Clark School Development and the Bungalow Phase at the State Hospital and I forget who else was on the list of privates. David McCutcheon who did that Deep Woods, yep. cool. which is cool. such a great cool. model cool. for elders. When is that going to be? You're not sure yet. We. The public would be able to go, right? It's the first Monday in April. I think it was April 4th, and we were going to try to book a room and get everybody invited as soon as possible. It just, you know, usually when we've done this in the past, the developers will come in and say, just show me land, you know, yeah. that I can develop, and mm -hmm. I will do a project here. Or do you have something that you can give me? You know, so it's always the kind of just yeah. trying to m match everybody. So we're just going to... We're just going to blow it out. We're going to put everybody in a room and just see what people yeah. are thinking, what the current obstacles are, what their barriers are, what kind of funding they might need, who's looking for what. And where because would that production be is. Here? Um, we were talking about the JFK community room because at the senior center, you got to be out like at 4:30 in the afternoon, and I thought they had if you do an afternoon now. thing, I think we got to pay. Yeah, they want you to pay, janitor. and then and what happens is. Of course, then the director has to be there, and yeah. then that's comp time, and then that's how it all worked out. No, no, I'm serious. That's that's what. Oh, happened. absolutely. Yeah, that's how it worked out. All right, so we're going to use probably JFK. Yeah. But, how, um, how many people you anticipate? Thirty. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Use the Education Foundation, uh, Francis Crowley room. Would they be presentation system inside? How many will I have? Uh, I think it's capacity 50, 60, something like that. Oh, really? Oh, I haven't been in there in a while. It's, mm. it, it, you know, the, it's an all-purpose room, so you either have a large table in the middle where everyone sits around, or you just line it up with chairs. And Where's this one, Bill? At, at, behind Woodstar, right yeah, in the old fire station. station. Oh, okay. <clears throat> it's an easy commute for me. I'm the next door over, literally, I open my door out of my office and walk in the community room, so mm -hmm. I can... Yeah. Could I ask you, Ted, um, when would our packets be ready? Um, the RFP is not due until the end of this month. So let's do February 28th. So probably, I think that's a. You'll notify us when we can come and pick them up, right? Or I can bring them to you. Yeah. We don't have to. Just call I, me. You know, I expect the same. <laughs> We're in not a city hall. Yeah, we'll get them. We'll come banging on your door. Thank you, thank you. You're very welcome, and thank you for the time commitment in March. Yep. And we will make the best with what we have. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, I want to talk about the um, agenda for Peg. March. Thank oh. you, Peg Peg. Oh, yeah, Peg. Okay. Peg took up all of March anyway. Okay. March is... March. I'm not. Back. I'm not hearing back from comrades. Have you? About no, you're June? not from March. No, June. Yeah, I haven't you were heard trying to get him for June. But anyways, I just want to do a little update here on our March agenda. We have Lucy Hartree coming in from Tapestry Health, and she is going to do program descriptions. She's also going to talk about Tapestry Health and Massachusetts health care reform, and also questions and answers from us. Then we have the group coming in from the Veterans Council, so we got full house on the schedule. So, no, I have not heard from David at all. Okay, and I'm still trying to get Grace House. Okay. So, we'll talk about that. Oh, good. Appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'll make the motion. Yeah? I'll second it before you make it. All right. <laughs> Aye. Aye. <laughs> We're out of here. Oh.